Now, he says, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Now, circumcision was the badge of the law. And if you so much as put on the badge, and a badge indicates what organization that you belong to. Most lodges and organizations today, they have badges that you're to wear. I'm of the opinion that it'd be nice if Christians wore a badge. I've never been much on wearing badges. I go to conventions. I try to steer clear of the table where they put a badge on you. I just don't like wearing badges. But I'm not sure but what Christians should have a badge, because that's about the only way they can tell we're Christians most of the time is by the badge that we would wear. But Paul says, if you so much as put on the badge of the law, which is circumcision, he says, actually, Christ does not profit you anything. If you are looking to anything else other than Christ. Now, I hope you can see the reason for that. And there's a good, sound, logical reason. And let me illustrate with a very homely illustration. Years ago in my Southland, there was a tonic that was advertised that was named Hadical, I think was the name of it. And I think it was put off the market. I do not know all the details, but I think they found about 75% of it was alcohol. And a lot of people were using it, by the way. And I knew a lot of Christian people that said, my, it certainly helped you, makes you feel good. And 75% alcohol would have that effect, I'm sure. And so they were taking had a call. Now, suppose that you wrote a testimonial. You had taken had a call, and you write a testimonial to the people. And they were great at giving out testimonials. And the testimonial would read something like this. You would say, I took 513 bottles of your medicine. And before I took the medicine, I could not walk. And now... I'm able to run, and I'm actually able to fly. I really have been improved. But also during that time, I made up a bottle of my own concoction, my own medicine, and I took that bottle also. I think you ought to know that. Now, my friend, you sure muddied the water. You can't tell now whether the 513 bottles of Hadicol is the thing that cured you, or whether it was your own bottle, uh, that concoction that you had made up. You see, the minute you put something else in, you're not quite sure. And so if it's Christ plus something, then Paul goes so far as to say this. Now, will you hear me very carefully today? Paul says, if you go so far as to be circumcised, are to add, that's just the badge of the law. If you go so far as to say that you have done something or that you went through some experience and that that is your salvation, he says you're really not saved because Christ won't profit you anything. How can he profit you anything? Because you made up a bottle of your own concoction and you did not trust him alone for your salvation. Dr. Schaefer used to put it like this, and it always impressed me. He said, I want to so trust Christ that if someday when I come into his presence, he would say to me, why are you here? And I'd say, I trusted you as my Savior. And he'd say, well, that's rather commendable, and I'm very happy you did that. But what have you done? Well, he said, I haven't done anything. Well, he says, no, I happen to know that you were president of a seminary. Don't you want to mention that? He said, no, I never trusted that for salvation. Well, you were baptized, I know. Yes, but I never trusted that for salvation. Well, you were a member of a church. Yes, but I never trusted that for salvation. But you did many nice, fine things that you were commended for. Yes, but I never trusted that. And the Lord Jesus would say, well, I'm sorry, I can't receive you. And he says, I want to so trust Christ that I'd say to him, I'm sorry. And I'd turn and walk away and say, I only trusted you as my Savior. My friend, is that the way you and I are trusting him today? Is that the way that we're resting on 
the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. Paul makes it very strong. Don't blame me for it. Paul says, Behold, I, Paul, send you, not I, Vernon McGee. Now, this is not Vernon McGee's interpretation. This is Paul. I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. That is, if you trust the badge even, if you trust the law, if you trust anything other than Christ, you're not a Christian. Now, that's Paul. I didn't say it, friends, so don't blame me for it. Just tell me what he means if this is not what he means here. And I'd like to know if he means something else, why he didn't say something else. This is what he says. He says, verse 3 now, For I testify again to every man that's circumcised that he's debtor to do the whole law. You see, you can't just draw out of the law what you like, and especially they like to leave out the penalties and a great deal of the detail. I'm delighted today that I'm not under law. I'm not under law at all. And the liberty that I have in Christ. Now, I must confess I have a problem of pleasing him always. I'm sure that my conduct always doesn't please him, but he's the one I'm trying to please. It's not following some legal system. Now he says, For I testify again to every man that's circumcised. He's debtor to do the whole law. Now listen to him. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you're fallen from grace. Now what he's saying is this. But if you, having been saved by trusting Christ, if you now are coming down to a low level and living by law, then he says you've fallen from grace. And that's what falling from grace actually means. It, I think, is something that is greatly misunderstood today. I can remember when I was a student in a denominational seminary by one theologian. He says that Falling from grace is the doctrine which the Methodists believe and the Presbyterians practice. Well, I'm sure that most of them practice it today. Actually, it doesn't mean falling into some open sin or careless conduct, and by so doing that you forfeit your salvation and you have to be saved all over again. It has no reference to that, of course, at all. Falling from grace is, I think, opposite of once saved, always saved. I think both expressions are unfortunate terminology. Well, falling from grace is, Paul answers it now in the rest of this chapter. He answers it in Romans. Paul in Romans begins with man in the place of total bankruptcy, no righteousness, completely depraved, unprofitable, rotten fruit, if you please. Man is a sinner before God. Now, at the conclusion of Romans, you see man in the service of God. He's asked to do certain things. He's admonished to perform certain things. And he's completely separated to God. He must be obedient to God. Man is a servant of God. Now, there are two mighty works of God stand between the man in his fallen condition and man in service to God. What are those? Salvation and sanctification. Now, salvation is justification by faith, as we've seen. And that is something that's all important. Now, sanctification means now that you're saved. Uh, it doesn't mean get busy. It means simply this, that you're now coming up to a new plane of living. You are now been saved. I think the greatest fallacy of the Christian life is today that service is essential, that you must get busy immediately. You know, the early church was more concerned with its life, the life of the church, and that life was a witness to the world. And today we've forgotten that. The outside world is looking at the church and passing it by, and looking at many of us believers and passing us by. Why? Because, very frankly, we are always busy out yonder handing out tracts, buttoning old people, and we don't have a life to back it up. We need today a life to back that up and to know by experience these things. And rather than trying to do good, we ought to live good. And then if we are, then we're going to be doing good, if you please.